Welcome to Tell a Friend. I return today with an extended interview with a legendary poet, author and educator, Nikki Giovanni. In the following interview, we discuss everything from her contribution to the black arts movement, her famous interview with James Baldwin and her close friendships with literary titans, Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou. Now I have to tell you, this is an extremely special interview for me, so I'm beyond excited to share it with all of you. So this is my interview with Nikki Giovanni. Thank you for agreeing to come onto the show. How have you been adjusting to this crazy pandemic? Well, you know, uh, as a black American growing up through segregation, the pandemic isn't all that different. Uh, the, the, and that's the truth. The difference is that uh, people have to wear masks during the day. And so you don't, the, the people don't wear masks at, at, at midnight. And, and white masks and ride up in horses and hang you. This is a, a situation of they put a mask on some do, and some are foolish and don't, including the, um, the president. But uh, the people are, are, are bitching about it, but uh, about every, what, 50 years or so, we have a, a, a serious um, disease that, that goes through. And uh, I was laughing with Jenny, who was my partner here, um, the earth is overcrowded. <laughs> and uh, one of the things you don't, I don't know what you believe in, or I'm not trying to ask, and I'm not, you know, trying to be involved with it. But one of the things that uh, the Lord will do every now and then is, is we either have a big war. So right now we haven't been having any wars. So, you know, God just sent, a, a, you know, a virus down. So you can see who he's mad at, and you see who he's not. And I know people are saying, well, a lot of black people are dying, but a lot of other people that we're not even wanting to talk about are dying. A lot of people are dying, and they have always. And I'm not casual about their death because we have a fool in, in, uh, in the White House, and, and a fool would understate it. But if you have somebody like the son of Satan in the White House, you're going to have this kind of situations. And so to begin our interview, I wanted you to take me back to Little Yolande growing up in Ohio and navigating the world. What was life like for that young girl? Well, you know, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of life. And I'm always laughing because your generation, uh, and, and, and a little bit younger than you, have the highest suicide rate. And uh, it, it really, it breaks my heart when I, I hear that the youngsters like, and, and I'm not, but, but you know, your, your, your generation has, has found a, a level of unhappiness and they don't want to continue or they don't want to, uh, uh, they don't seem to find that level of, of happiness. We knew what we had to do, my generation, I'm 76. We knew that we had to break down segregation. And we know that we who are black Americans, we have saved America. One of the problems right now is, is that the white Americans have not done and are not doing their part by getting rid of Donald Trump, who is bringing in a, another level of hatred and another level of, of uh, uh, I don't even know what the word is, disgust. It's sort of like having a, a, a I, don't, I don't know why they don't know that Hitler did the same thing. And so I think that right now, white people have to do their job because black people, my generation has done our job. And I think as we grew up, we felt like we had a job to do and we were very, um, very strong in, in doing it. Some names you know, and some names you uh, don't know. I'm a Fisk University graduate. And so I was very uh, fortunate. I knew John Lewis and, and Diane Nash, and uh, actually John and I graduated uh, at the same at the same time. And when you when you grow up with people that level of courageous, and everybody knows Martin, and everybody knows Ralph Abernathy. You know these are, but it, and these are great people. Don't misunderstand me. But it's the people who who walked. It's the people who watched the sheriff come and with with bang. They're gonna going to hit them in the head. It, these are great people. And uh, my generation is a great generation. I think that your generation ought to stand up to it and quit all of the, you know, they're unhappy. Well, who wasn't? <laughs> Unhappiness is a part of life, <laughs> you know. And when you were studying at Fisk University, am I right in believing you were studying history? I am a history major, yes. We have that in common. I study history as well. And I wanted to know what kind of historical topics were you learning about? Because there's all of this discussion about the curriculum, and it's, it'd be interesting to find out what kind of stuff you were being taught. 
Well, uh, American history, uh, again, there's no American history without Black American history. And there's no Black American history without looking at the, the history of, of slavery. And a part of slavery, and we have to remember that, is that uh, slave trade was, was a, uh, a, a back and forth. It, it, was, it was not alone. It was not a bunch of Europeans woke up one morning and said, oh, let's start a slave trade. The, there was an African who sold an African to a European. And we need to remember that. And as we got to America, we had to make adjustments, but America had to make adjustments, if you're following, okay? And one of the things, I was uh, laughing the other day with a group when I was speaking, I, when nobody's traveling right now, is that we forget that the language that I am now speaking to you is not English, it's really American. And you, you're in London. So one of the things you know is that I am not speaking to you in the language that you hear every day. If somebody has to go to the bathroom where you are, they oh, I need a loo. Or, you know, they oh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting the queen. And, and we are talking two different languages. The language I speak is a language that my ancestors created and, and made a part of. And it had to be done. And I'm not, this is not a good idea, but in order to talk to the slaves, they had to learn the slave language. And they had to learn how it is that we communicated. And we had a lot to do with the making of this nation. And I think it's important that we who are black, are, 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 that we're proud of that. We know that the music that we hear, the music that you're listening to right there in London is the music that my ancestors created. And you hear rap now as, as we have created, you hear rap all over the world, everybody rap. You can go to China and hear rap. And I, I think to be a black American is, is a really, um, it, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. I, I'm, I'm getting ready. This is more what they call Memorial Day here in, in America. It's not, <laughs> I'm not that interested in it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix some uh, uh, spare ribs. I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to uh, roast some ribs. And I was looking at it and said, yeah, we're the ones, people would give us the ribs because they thought they were no good, but we're the ones that made a culinary situation in America. We're the ones that, that make what we eat. We're the ones that did the grits. We're the ones that, that uh, actually chitlins, and a lot of black people don't like chitlins. I think chitlins are wonderful. It, uh, they just take a long time to cook. I love pig feet. And so, yeah, they're, they're just things that, that we have done, we being black Americans. And as we learn history, and I think that that's important. I teach creative writing, but I have had various classes that I have actually, we have cooked chitlins so that we could talk about them. And the kids are like, like oh, you know, and I didn't know that's what they tasted like. Well, you, if you're eating, you know, Wendy's and, and Arby's and all that crap, chitlins are way better <laughs> for you. But I've, I've had my classes to eat and drink things that my people made that, that, that Black Americans put into the culinary situation. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> It's funny you brought up food because whenever I watch interviews of yours, I see just how passionate you are for food and <laughs> what, what power do you think food has in kind of bringing people together? Always. I, I, I'll always remember, uh, we were talking the other day, I belong to a group called the Wintergreen Sisters. And we always, we talk about food. We get together once a year and, and we, we laugh about a lot of things, but we talk about food because we remember what our grandmothers did. And we got together, usually on Sundays, if we were, were lucky, we got together on Sundays and somebody cooked something and brought it, brought it over. I'm, a, I'm good with uh, protein, I'm good with, with meat. And so if it would be my turn as I became about your age, I would take a ham over, something that you know, we could slice, or I make a pretty good steak, but I make excellent fried chicken. And I learned to do that from my from my grandmother, but food is something you share. I mean, food is like love, not like, food is love. And sitting at the table, talking with some people, laughing and eating, that, that's, that's what life is. I and mean, what, what, else, what else is important, <laughs> you know? No, that, that's very true. I mean, you're clearly someone who likes London. Do you, is there any British food that sticks out to you that you enjoyed? Well, actually my favorite, food in London is Japanese. <laughs> oh, the Japanese have that wonderful wagyu. And, <laughs> oh my. And I really like Harrods because I wear their, their, they have socks and I wear their socks. So when I, go, when I get a chance to go to London, I can, uh, I go to Harrods and there's a whole uh, uh, 
wall of socks so I can buy some socks and then go downstairs into the food court and have a, a Wagyu steak. And then my trip is made. Then I go and do what I, I came there to do, whatever work I came there to do. So you haven't tried fish and chips? I have tried fish and chips, but uh, again, I'm a black American. So for to me, if you're going to have fish and it's going to be fried, you can't have any batter. I, I, I don't. I don't know why people do that. Why would you mess up something with, with batter? And so for me, if you've got chips, if you've got fish, what you've got is, uh, I love, of course, catfish. And I was talking recently about my friend, Tony Morrison, who has recently passed. And Tony liked porgies. And so when I was lucky to find porgies and I could call her and say, you know, are you home? Are you busy? I could take porgies up there. And I fry mine, not in, in batter at all, but in very, very light. You can fry it in grits or you can fry it in uh, corn, cornmeal. And I fry most things in in, um, in butter, but I've been known to, uh, because I really do enjoy that too, I've been known to use sometimes duck fat. I don't know if you've tried duck fat. It really I, is. I haven't tried it yet. It's, it's just a nice, gives you another kind of flavor. But I'm not a, I'm not a chips person. I, I bet you in my whole life I haven't eaten a bag of potato chips. Or, I'm, you know, those things are, are what is it? Uh, chips are, are fried potatoes. And I think potatoes were made for water. You put, you peel them and you put them in water and you boil them. Well, you're not missing anything. It's one of the more fattening foods we have over here. But I wanted to move, uh, shift our conversation to your poetry. And could you talk to me and my listeners about how you became involved in poetry and your journey to becoming this legendary poet that you're renowned for? Well, that's very kind of you and thank you. I think that words, I would, and I don't think that, words are important. And again, I come from a people, my ancestors were forbidden to read and write. And if I were 50 years younger, that'd be in my 20s, and hist historically speaking, I might study, or I would study, the commonality of uh, 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 folklore, and spirituals, because they were both from people who could not and were not allowed to read and write, but they both were ways of telling the children, this is the life that, we're lead that, that we are leading, and this is how we get through it. This is how we go on, I guess. The word I would want to use, I guess, is uh, continue. I know that words are important because I watch people use words that upset people. If people call you a name, they can actually bring tears to your eyes. They can hurt your feelings. Or you can feel like, oh, he said this to me and I don't have any more friends or things like that. And when I was growing up, it just very, again, interesting to me that people could say things. They could call you, if I look at us, you are darker than I am. So if I said something, if I wanted to be mean in the old days, I would call you something about the color of your skin and you would feel bad and you'd go home and say, mommy, why did they say that? And I can't think of anything dumber than letting a word hurt you because there's another word that will make you not only feel better, but that will show that you're loved. And I grew up, I'm just very, very fortunate. I had a wonderful grandmother and I grew up with a grandmother who didn't believe, who, who, who believed that words should be used to teach you and words should be used to comfort you. And my grandfather was a Latin teacher in high school. That's when in the high school they, they taught real things. And grandpapa taught Latin. And so words meant a lot to him. And so for me, you said, how did I become a poet? All I know are words. I'm not, I laugh about it, but it's true. I'm not big, I'm not strong, I'm not talented. You know, I, my sister could, could sing and dance and she could play the piano. I can't do any of those things. And uh, all I could do was listen. And I did listen, and then I, I began to either, I don't know if the word would be share or expose, it, it, it doesn't matter, but my feelings would come out. I've tried to use words to, to, to protect myself, to explain my people, not to other people, because I'm, I don't care about other people, frankly speaking. I, I, I think that it's important that we understand each other to ourselves, that the truth come to ourselves. And, and I think that, um, I think we've missed that. I think a lot of what we've had to say has been 
to other people to try to explain to white Americans why they should not treat us the way they do or whatever it is that they're doing. But I think that what we have to do is, is realize how do we treat ourselves because those other people can't possibly matter. So did you see poetry and the medium as a whole as being a way to kind of reclaim your pride, reclaim your identity? Was that what it served for you? Well, you say um, reclaim, but see, I never lost it. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, it's just use. The word would be use. And the thing, one of the things that I love best, of course, are spirituals. And uh, I live with my grandmother, so of course I went, no, not of course, but my grandmother happened to be Baptist. My mother was AME, African Methodist Episcopal, but grandmother was Baptist and grandpapa was Baptist. He was the deacon of, of Mount Zion Baptist Church. So again, what we, it wasn't a re reclamation, it was a use. So we sang every, we opened church with leaning on the everlasting arms. I don't know if you know that, you might not. It's not, you know, there's no reason that you would know unless you begin to study it. You know, we're leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm, leaning on the everlasting arm. Well, if you think about being a black American, leaning on the everlasting arms, that's a, that's a powerful thing. And to teach that as we were taught to our children, that's a powerful thing. And it wasn't a reclamation, it was a, cl a cl it, we claimed it, that we, these arms are arms we can lean on and no matter what you do, that, that's, a, you know, there's a wonderful, uh, well, the, the spirituals are, are just so, are just so great. There's another one that says, give me Jesus. I heard my mother say, give me Jesus. And her mother's dying. I mean, and this is a, 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 a spiritual of uh, recognizing death. You know, I heard my mother say, give me Jesus. And if you think about the power of that, it, that's a wonderful thing. And this is what these people taught us. And this is what we learned and believed. And I think this is why we have remained sane and, and I think loving. Now you've just spoken there about the influence of your grandmother. <clears throat> and from my research, I've seen that um, it was the death of your grandmother that actually spurred you into your poetry writing career. Could you talk to me about how that experience inspired you into poetry? Uh, I, I really don't know. I, I miss grandmother, I still do. And uh, grandmother, thank goodness, uh, was alive when I graduated. I graduated from Fisk in 60 years, 67. And I'm so glad because she had always wanted to see, and she, I wanna see my baby graduate. And it's something that I say to high school and I speak with high schoolers and I point that out to them. You know, you think you're in high school or you think you're in college to learn something. I don't know what there is to learn today. I really don't. You and I have struggled just to get this interview going. And everybody says, oh, look at what, look at what we've learned. I don't know what we've learned, but I, I, do know, I don't. I do know that we go to graduate, not because we're learning something, but because those little old ladies sat on the porch and wanted to see us do something. So we do something for them because we wanted that di diploma put on the wall for them. We wanted those people to be in the audience, which is why I, my heart breaks really for class of 2020. And I wrote a letter to the, to the editor. I thought it was a nice letter, frankly speaking, sent to the editor of our, our local paper saying, I was just so sorry for the class of 2020 that they couldn't walk across the stage. And do you know people wrote letters saying, you know, what's wrong with her? You know, they are the kids ought to grow up, they ought to quit whining. And I thought you sons of bitches. They, the, the people, uh, that's I really did. These, the, the, the families, in many cases, uh, I am not the first person in my family to graduate from college. I, I mentioned my grandpapa. Grandpapa was a Fisk University class in 1905. My, uh, my, my sister didn't graduate until later, but my mother and her two sisters were college graduates. But the point is, you don't do that for yourself. You do that for the people that got up every morning just a little before dawn and walked God knows how long to work in some white woman's tr uh, kitchen so that she could have enough money to send you to school. It's not that you weren't learning something, and I just, I'm not against learning, but it's not what you were learning. It was that you were gonna get something that you can hand to them and say, you made this possible. So my question is, you asked me a question, I'm gonna go back. Who do we owe what to? And what we owe is our allegiance to our ancestors. So I have no question about things like that. 
I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly comfortable about who I owe, who my audience is, who is reading me. So if only one person were reading me, I know that one person would be grandmother. And if that's the only person that was reading me, it would be fine by me. No, I think that's beautiful. And especially what you were saying about the impact of all of this on the class of 2020. I, I feel that at a personal level because I was meant to be graduating this summer. And it, I just think this whole pandemic has forced us to rethink the way we operated from before. And it doesn't look like things will return to normal. I mean, we'll obviously overcome it in some way, but we've got to try and adjust to this crazy predicament we find ourselves in. I don't like normal, uh, frankly speaking, because again, I'm, I'm 76 years old, so normal to me is segregation. And if I roll it back a little bit, normal is, is the Ku Klux Klan. Normal is, is what, uh, white supremacy. So I'm not, I'm not so sure that normal works for me. I like continue. And I think your class, and I, I, I don't know your parents, but I'm sure that they're very proud of you. They're more proud of you than you learned something. <laughs> and I know you know that. You know, I don't know you, and I know you know that, that they wanted to see their boy take another step. Now, what that other step is, I would have no idea. But I think it's only fair that you take that step. Again, the spiritual say that we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher and higher. I love the spirituals because they, they give you that comfort. So you have a step to take. I don't know what it is. So when people call me, and they do every now and then, you know, something will happen. I'll say, well, what do you think about, you know, uh, 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 Black Lives Matter, or what do you think about, you know, be something crazy. And I said, well, I think that what, what the youngsters are doing, I think. I think that they know what they're doing. Don't, don't call me because I, why, why would I judge what they're doing? Every round goes higher and higher. And all I did, I took my step. And now I'm supposed to get out of the way and let the youngsters, let you struggle with, with video that, that you know neither one of us understand. That, that what they're looking at in the back of me is Virginia Tech where I, uh, I'm a university distinguished professor, but that's Virginia Tech. But Every round goes higher. There was a time that, uh, and Virginia Tech made that mistake of asking me to write about the first woman because it, it used to be in middle school. And, you know, it's one of those, yeah. And Nikki, you know, we're going to put together a book. Would you, would you write something for us on the first woman who came to Virginia Tech? And I said, certainly, because, and I wrote it, and they had to use it. But the first woman that came to Virginia Tech cleaned the dorms and changed the beds and was probably and most likely black. And probably and most likely was a slave. That was the first woman. And they hadn't thought about it that way because they were trying to save the first woman who entered the classroom to sit down in the class. Well, I'm happy for her. But the first woman did the dirty work, didn't get paid for it, didn't get thanked for it. And we don't know her name. There's not gonna be a, 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 a statue in Virginia Tech to say this is the first woman at Virginia Tech. You understand what I'm saying? And so I think, I think that it's so important that the next generation, you and everybody else, I say my, my, my heart goes out to 2020 because you should be able to celebrate. It should be something that you know somebody, if not your parents or your grandparents, you know one of your ancestors said, well, my baby graduated. Somebody's glad you're in London. Somebody's like, oh, he got to look. You took that step and that's, that's, that's what your generation is going to do. And your children, whatever children mean, because I'm not into the biology, I think that's overblown blown too. Oh, you know, I have, well, did you have him or did you, come on, you know, you, you, <laughs> what do you mean that I have it? I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of adoption and I birthed a child, but it, it, it doesn't matter. I'm a big fan of, if you love somebody enough to let somebody else have that child to do something that you couldn't have done, I think that's love. And I think anybody doesn't understand that, it's just being foolish. Well, not foolish, evil and mean. Because maybe nobody would take them. They would be the dog left in the kennel. Yeah, I, I mean, children and family, it's all very subjective. Um, and as you say, you can't delineate it so specifically. But I wanted to just rewind a bit. You spoke about you graduating in 67. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, a year later, obviously, the tragic assassination of Dr. King happened. And I was wondering if you could talk to me about the societal impact that that death had and what you remember of its significance in America. Well, of course, Martin's death was a sad, uh, God, I mean, if you start to look at the death of black people, not to mention black men, I think we have to roll it back, of course, to Emmett Till and the death of Emmett and, and the bravery of Mose Wright, who recognized when those men, when, 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 when Bryant and uh, Milan took, uh, Milan took Emmett out of his house, that this was gonna be a terrible thing. And you remember Mose Wright, who was his uncle, who was Emmett's uncle, put his family in the car and drove, I'm sure all night, they were in Mississippi, drove to Chicago to leave his family because he came back because he was gonna testify against them. And you just, it, I say Mo's right, you have no idea who I'm talking about. I know you don't, uh, and you're a history major. And I'm, I'm not picking on you, I'm just saying, so many people we don't know. But Emmett was viciously, viciously murdered. Mo's right said, dar he, and pointed to the men who murdered him. This was a great, this was a great man. He also, of course, a, uh, Mamie, Mamie uh, Till Bradley, his mother, Emmett's mother, said, no, we're gonna, the, the uh, undertaker said, I, I can't do anything with this. I, I, I can't make it better. And she said, no, open this casket. I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And so we've got Mamie who only died uh, last year, I believe it was last year that, that Mamie, that uh, Mrs. Till died, well, she's not Mrs. Till, Miss Bradley died. We had the death of, of, uh, of course, uh, Medgar Evers who lived across the street from my good friend, Margaret Walker, the great poet and, and, and novelist, Jubilee, and that great poem for my people. Uh, 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 Medgar lived directly catacorner across the, across the street. We had the death, of course, of Malcolm X. And Malcolm X changed a lot, of, not changed, but I guess made a lot of black Americans who were thinking, well, maybe he's pushing it too hard. Or, you know, I don't know what they think. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Malcolm, but I knew his wife and I know his daughters. And I know that he has great daughters and, and uh, Betty is a wonderful, wonderful woman. And, and we, we miss Betty, uh, her, her presence. So by the time, and I don't, uh, I'm not dismissing anybody's death, but everybody knew Martin was gonna get killed because this is America. And in America, what we do is we shoot people. <laughs> you know, I, my favorite movie, of course, is the Godfather. I absolutely adore, I do, I adore the Godfather because it's so much of what happens in the Godfather is American history. It is exactly what we did, it, all of it, one, two, and three, looking at all of it, you see American, you see American history. So losing Martin was not um, a surprise. Uh, it was sad. Um, I, I, it, it was sad that it happened, I'm a Knoxvillian, which is the other exact opposite of the state. Uh, it happened in Memphis, which is very close to uh, Mississippi. There are still questions about the death of Martin. And if your generation doesn't answer, uh, your children, as I say, I'm not dealing with whether you birth them or not, you know, but your, the next generation, there's still questions about the murder of um, Martin Luther King, like there are questions about the murder of um, John Kennedy. They're, they're just, there are questions that, that have, not been, um, have not been resolved. And of course we miss Martin, but everybody, all of a sudden, everybody loves Martin because now he's dead. And again, words, Martin showed us how powerful words were, but our words are. But what was also powerful was that the people in following and, and following the words and also in, in creating the reason for the words. If 100,000 people or so had not come to the mall, Martin, could not have given the I have a dream speech. It just, it, it couldn't have happened. He had given that speech, as you know, before, because it was Mahalia Jackson, who was the only woman on, on, the, on the stand there. It was Mahalia who said, tell him about the dream, doc, tell him about the dream. Because Martin was finished. If you look at that first part of the speech, he had made a good, we are here to cash a check. He had made a clear, a clear statement, but, Mahalia Jackson was really the only person on that stage who was a star in, in all respect. And Mar Mahalia knew that the, 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 the group, 
the crowd had not been satisfied, that there was a hunger. And you'll see that if you, you can look at, she pulls his jacket and says, tell them about the dream, because she knew they needed something more. They needed words to carry them forward. So we miss Martin. We have, every, everybody forgets that Martin's murder, m m mother was murdered in the church. We, we don't even talk about that. Nobody talks about that. A, a man came in and, sh and shot Mrs. King. You, 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 we forget about that. We, we forget that uh, recently we had uh, uh, Dylan Roof who went into a church and shot seven people. And everybody said, oh, I'm sure he, he, was, he was mentally un, un, incapable. We had a man to put bombs in, in, in the Birmingham Baptist Church. We are, we are uh, death is not something we fear. But then Jesus said that. And so most, most blacks, not all, and I'm not, again, there's nobody, it's, I don't care what you believe. What, I don't mean I don't care. I mean, you have a right. But most blacks are... Uh, are, are Christians. And one of the reasons that we, we all feel that Jesus went on the cross was to show us you cannot fear death. Do not fear death. Do your job. And he says that. He said that to his father, forgive them. I don't think if they shot me, I don't think my last words would be forgive them. I, I think I'd have something a little more evil. No, I'm, I, but I'm not Jesus. <laughs> and, and he is. But I think that, and, and I think that, you know, you studied history. One of the reasons he was on the cross was to say, you cannot be afraid of death. We go forward. And shortly before he died, there was this big debate between, as you mentioned, Malcolm X, who was another key leader in the black community, and him. Now, I say this carefully because I don't, I don't want to fall into the trap of pitting the two men against each other, because in many ways they were very similar. But when you were hearing these ideological debates going about, did you associate with one of the debates or so did you take the approach of Martin Luther King? Did you prefer the approach of Malcolm X or what was your feeling around that time? My feeling was that I'm to do the job in front of me. So if the job in front of me is we're supposed to march, I try to march. I was not important. I've always said that and it's true. I didn't do anything important. You never, you know, <laughs> you just never saw me. I just did what was there to be done. I, I, I was, was very fortunate. My sister uh, was a friend of Fannie Lou Hamer, and I hope you know who Mrs. Hamer is because she, she is so important in the Voting Rights Act that we're dealing with now. And my sister would uh, cook and, and take food. She and, and, uh, and uh, Jim Lowry, Reverend Lowry, they would go down. So I got to not know Fannie Lou Hamer because Ms. Hamer was not a friend, but I know who she is, and I got to, Gary would say, well, you know, we need, we need to get a hammer, we need to get this, that, and the other. And like a lot of people, I could raise some money to help get that done, or I could take it down, or go down to, to Mississippi. Uh, I got to meet Ms. Hamer, but uh, we were not, as I say, we we're not friends. I didn't think that I had to make a decision, and I didn't think what I thought was anybody's business, because we had two men who were trying to help freedom come. One is going to be uh, uh, a Christian and one is going to be uh, Islamic. One is going to be have been in, in prison and one is going to have been a graduate of Morehouse. But if Martin were here today, I do think that he would recognize the, the one thing, the one thing, Brian, that I think this, this uh, uh, virus has done is to teach people what it feels like to be locked up. I kind of love it. Everybody, I, I, I write several prisoners because uh, Again, you, you're supposed to do that. They write me and I write back. You know, it's one of those kind of things. One, one, one guy is like my brother, uh, Brian, his name, his name uh, also is Daryl Lamont. His name is Daryl. And uh, I write Daryl and we, we, we talk about things. But now everybody knows what it feels like to be locked up all day, to have to have, well, in, in our cases, and I say our, I mean those of us not, we have to put a mask on before we can go out. In their case, they have to be chained. So now everybody knows. Maybe prison isn't the best idea. Maybe there ought to be some other way to deal with it. But we also know that prison is about uh, about racism. We know that prison is about uh, uh, it's, it's about racism. It's just that simple. We have uh, so many black men and women in jail, and the idea that uh, drugs 
that that you can control drugs. It's the same people, 19th Amendment, you know, it's like, oh, not the 19th, I'm sorry, the uh, 18th uh, Amendment is saying, you know, well, you can't, you can't drink. We don't think you should drink. Well, if you don't want to drink, you shouldn't drink. But the rest of us want to drink. When it, when it gets to be seven o'clock, I would like to have a drink. So I'm not going to make you have one, but I'm not going to let you. And we know that that uh, the 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 uh, 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 amendment stopping drinking was the one that created drugs. And I don't do drugs, of course, not of course. I don't do drugs, but there are people that I know who do, and it's their business. We ought to sell drugs like we sell any other thing. It ought to be on the, sh on the shelf in Kroger's. You ought to be able to go in there and get yourself, well, at one point you did, a pack of cigarettes or whatever it is that they do. Uh, I don't know how you sell cocaine, but I know that if, if we're gonna send men and women off to war to commit horrible acts and then bring them home, and we don't, we, they don't have a job, they don't have any place to live, and they have to live with the fact that they have done horrible things. And now for a horrible man, they need, a, they need a drug because they can't live with themselves. So one of the other things is that not only should we legalize drugs, but we should in fact do more for our, our veterans. We should bring them home and we should take care of them. None of which we're doing. And on the subject of veterans and uh, their treatment, a common issue is the mental health of a lot of these veterans coming over, uh, coming back from wherever they've been fighting. And I wonder, do you think after this pandemic has passed, there'll be a big upsurge in mental illness globally because of what everyone's experiencing right now? I, I, I honestly can't answer. I, I honestly don't know. It's not something that uh, at this point in my level of study, I can study. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I do know as we were sharing, I was trying to share, I know what has happened when people come home from war because we've seen it. We've seen it for uh, my father's generation and not my father, he did not go uh, to, to Korea, but my father's generation had Korea. Uh, we, we've had, uh, of course, now we're in uh, Afghanistan. Your, my generation had Vietnam. And of course, one of the great men of our generation was uh, Muhammad Ali when they were gonna make him go to, they thought they were gonna make him go to, to uh, Vietnam. And he said, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger. And when he stood up for that, he, you talk about change. That was, a, that was a major change when Ali stood up and said no. Now we know that Elvis Presley went to, to, went to so-called war because uh, he, he goes to Germany where he's gonna be safe and marries an underage child, right? And so that's supposed to make sense. And that girl was underage and then, you know, we're supposed to go, oh, Elvis got married, you know, and it makes you crazy. But they weren't gonna send Muhammad Ali to Germany to be safe. They were gonna send him to a battlefield, they were gonna kill him. And he did the right thing. And, and, and the black community, as you know, and I'm so proud of all of us, including me, we stood up for, for Ali. We didn't care what, again, we knew the audience. And Ali knew his audience. And not a, any of it was the white people that were trying to kill him. The black people stood up for him. And, and I, I think that we continue to do that. I didn't have to choose between Malcolm and, and, and Martin because they were both not, they weren't choosing between me. They were, everybody was trying to do something to help. And I think that, the, I think that that's great. I, I really do. You, you miss them now. Uh, but one of the things that Black Lives Matter and one of the, the reasons I think that, that they're so incredibly uh, intelligent is that they're not a group. So there's no way to blow up their building. There's no way to, you know, they don't know who to shoot down. And I like that. I said, the, the kids have gotten smarter to say, well, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna give you a target. We're not gonna put a, 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 a target on our back. We're gonna go ahead and believe and, and do what we have to do. And I think the kids are doing a, a good, and I say the kids because I am 76, but I think the kids are doing a great job. And I'm very, I'm very proud to watch your generation and to watch them taking steps forward. And you speak of Muhammad Ali, who you famously interviewed uh, for Seoul. And as well as Muhammad Ali, you interviewed James Baldwin famously, Miriam Makeba. I mean, how did that job come about so early on after you just graduated? Well, I just, you, you say, uh, yes, I, I laugh. I have a dear friend 
who I call my literary son, and, and I love him so much. His name is Kwame Alexander. He's over there in Europe right now. He's over there in London, actually. And I, I, I said to Kwame, because I don't meddle in anybody's life. I, I just, it's not me. But, but as we were talking, and he was getting ready to begin his career, he wanted to be a writer. And he said, well, what advice would you give me? You know, we would just, we, we talked, we, we, I talked to him yesterday. And he said, well, what advice would you give me? I said, well, Kwame, what I would say is say yes. And I ended up working with, and had to be with because I wasn't working for, for Soul. It was uh, uh, Ellis Hazlip needed some, uh, I guess, somebody to talk to and maybe some advice because I, I listened to everybody. And as we were talking, I said, Let, let's try this, let's try that. You know, he just kept doing it. And so I ended up working with him because when he needed somebody, he would call me because he knew I would say yes. I still say yes. Well, as you know, I still say, I still say yes. If, if there's any way I can do something, uh, I just say yes. And, and I try to, I try to do it. I'm mad at, I'm going to send it to you. I'm mad at the New York Times right now because I wanted them, I want them to give me a, pay, not me, Nikki, but to give a page for Jericho Brown, who accepted the Pulitzer Prize. I think Jericho should have a page. And my friend Kwame and, and my good friend Joanne Gavin, we all, that's what I call my gang, we all kind of run together. And so I called them and said, you know, let's get a page for, for, for Jericho. And then it's like, yes, let's do that. Well, a page for the New York Times, they, they wanted like $50,000. Well, poets don't have $50,000. So I wrote them a letter and said, I think you should give us a page because I know that there is a man, and I, didn't, I did not name him, but we all know who it was, who took a page in the New York Times to accuse the Central Park Five and, and ask for their murder. He got the page. Why is it that when somebody is doing something to lift people up, they can't get a page? And I said, I'm going to send it to you, and I hope you send it to people. I want everybody to know that we love Jericho. He's our young brother. He's brilliant. And if I can't get a page, I can let the New York Times know, I hate you for not doing it. Back on the subject of Soul, your interview with Jane Baldwin was clearly, I mean, a massive interview at the time, and it's still well remembered today. What stood out to you from that interview with him? It was uh, wonderful. Ellis owed me a favor. And uh, every now and then, if you say yes enough, people owe you a favor. And Ellis owed me a favor at the end of the show. He said, well, what would you like? I said, gosh, I really loved, and I said at that point, to meet James Baldwin. And he said, well, I know him. I said, do you think I could interview him? And he said, well, I'll call him. He, he was not Jimmy to me at that point, but he said, I'll call Jimmy and, uh, and I'll see. And Baldwin said, oh, I'd love to talk with Nikki, but I don't have time to come to the United States. Will she come to London? And I said, I would walk across the ocean to come to, to talk to Jimmy Baldwin. And I had my son then, uh, Thomas, and I had a wonderful, uh, she died of cancer, unfortunately, Debbie uh, Russell. And so we went. I said, all I need is, is the ticket. So we went and we stayed. Um, now I don't know London that well. I haven't been. But we stayed in the hotel across from Princess Margaret's uh, grounds. And uh, her grounds, that, that park that, that was there is like a mile. And so my son, because Jimmy, everybody loved Jimmy. And it's just not possible. I don't know any child that didn't love him. There was something about Jimmy that children. So Jimmy is a night owl, though. And so we actually filmed that. You know, we started filming probably around 8, 7, 30, 8 o'clock. And we'd film for three hours or so. Then Jimmy would go out with his friends because he knew everybody and had friends. I would go home because I had a son and a babysitter to take care of. And we would be up in the morning. And Jimmy would be coming in. He'd come in at like, you know, seven in the morning. I'm there trying to get food down my child. And uh, Thomas would go, with, Jimmy Baldwin, Jimmy Baldwin, take me for a walk. And Baldwin would go like, well, Thomas, I need to go to bed. Because he'd been up all night drinking and having a good night. And Jimmy Baldwin, take me for a walk. And he would always do that every morning. And he would end up taking uh, Thomas for that, for that walk. It, it was really just wonderful uh, talking to Baldwin. I think that I, I began to relax. Uh, I have not seen the uh, the video, and I didn't ever see in my papers the entire video uncut is in my papers. But I don't like to look at what I did because if I keep looking at what I did, I'll be afraid of doing something that's very different. I'll be afraid of contradicting myself, which I probably do. You know, you you have to change. And so I've never looked at the whole thing. 
But uh, lately, about a year ago, people started to say, oh, I really enjoyed that conversation with Baldwin. I said, what conversation <laughs> with Baldwin? Because I had pretty much uh, uh, let it go. And it became a book. And uh, I have a copy of the book. And I think it's going to now be in, uh, there's a collection of books called The Last um, uh, Interview. And Jimmy's one of the last interviews. So I have given my permission. I don't know what, uh, what Jimmy's estate is going to uh, do. I know Helen, uh, and I think David is dead, but I don't, I don't know who controls his estate now. But uh, it, was, it was fun talking to Jimmy because at first, I was, I know, at first, but you know, it's Jimmy Baldwin and I'm not. So you're very nervous. But then we started talking about what we thought, how we thought each other should be treated. And I don't mean Jimmy and Nikki, I mean how men and women are, I, I really just like men that uh, hit women. It doesn't even make, it doesn't make sense. And I'm thinking, why would you come home and hit your wife when she's there home trying to cook? She's home trying to make a home for you, trying to let you know, there, there's a wonderful play and it's called Fences. And uh, August Wilson is beautiful. And uh, he's saying to her, he's finally uh, running around which is okay, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, it's none of my business. But he, he says to her, I can't give this woman up. She makes, me, she makes me feel, you know, good. She makes me feel like a man. And his wife says, you think all of these years that I haven't been lying to you? You can't lie to me? I've been lying to you all these, you, you think that I tell you you're the best in the world? You, you think I, I can't do this? Why can't you lie to me? If you're gonna, you're gonna be out there Collect, he's a garbage collector, which was very interesting. Uh, you, 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 you're collecting your garbage and you, you're, you're dealing with your, your, your boss and your, all of those people. And you're lying and smiling at them. And then you come home and I have to hear it. I just thought it was wonderful. It takes two people to have a relationship. Yeah, but, but, it, but the relationship. If you don't have a dream, fake it. But the relationship, you can't fake a dream. You've got to fake it. Because we don't have dreams these days. How the hell can you have a dream? For what? Well, it isn't so, so everybody's everybody's jiving, but let's jive on that level. If I love you, I can't lie to you. Of course you can lie to me, and you will. If you love me and you're going off with Maddie someplace, you're lying to me. Because what the hell do I care about the truth? I care if you're there. What Billy Holiday say, hush now, don't explain. All right, I accept that. Of course, All of right, course I you'll lie to me, because I don't even want to care. What, what does the truth matter? And why are you going to be truthful with me when you lie to everybody else? You lied when you smiled at that cracker down the job, right? Lie to me, smile. Treat me the same way you would treat him. I can't treat you. You must. Treat him. You must. Because I've caught the I've caught the frowns and the anger. He's happy with you. Of course he doesn't know you're unhappy. You grin at him all day long. You come home and I catch hell because I love you. I get least of you. I get I get the very minimum. And I'm saying, you know, fake it with me. Something that stood out for me from that conversation that you're talking about is how brave you were to hold him to task about that, but also how receptive he was to what you were saying. And I thought, I thought that was a great sign of humility uh, from his part and also bravery and courage because you were very young at that time and obviously it's James Baldwin. So, um, no, that's something that I hear a lot of people talk about that moment. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it again you try to do what you try to do so i'm just i'm just a poet all i have are words and so it, it seemed to me that my job was to to talk to to try to make sense and to, to to deal with what i've seen and a lot of what i've seen has been sad my father used to hit my mother and i never could understand that's why i i, I couldn't live with him anymore so i went to live with my grandmother i just I, I don't see it. I, I couldn't see the point. Somebody who cares about you, who's, why, why is that the person you're going to take it out on? Yeah, it's a case of misdirected rage. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's called something called grow up. <laughs> you know, it's like watching the games, you know, and uh, as I said, I, I, I and I'll have to write him and tell him I've talked about him a lot today. But it's like Daryl, and, and Daryl's in prison and will be in prison for the rest of his life because he was a part of a gang. And what a waste, because he's a smart man. He studies the Bible now. And so it's really been interesting in what he's doing. I don't, I can't 
do that because it, it takes too much, but I'm, I'm always, always glad to read uh, what he's doing. But why did, why did he have to be in prison before he sat down to say, well, let me see what I can do with this life? It just has to be something better. You just can't give your life away because you're upset with somebody who dislikes you. And, and therefore, you're not giving love to somebody who likes you. It <laughs> doesn't make sense. I have a, a student whom I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I love him so much as you hear me say that. But I have a student, his name is Jordan Holmes. And Jordan is um, a Chicagoan, and he writes poetry and he does rap. But he did a really uh, beautiful poem that he's letting me use. It's called Blackmail. I, I edited a book uh, that's entitled uh, Standing in the Need of Prayer, which is also a spiritual. Now, I've been writing books. I've had three bestsellers. I have a lot of awards, you know, and I'm saying this to say not one of the people that I've worked with, not one of my publishers will publish this book. And it was one of those things I thought, well, why? And because it's, 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 a, um, it's a love poem for, for black men. And everybody's like, oh, I'm not sure we want, you know, and I thought, well, it took me a minute to, to, to put that together. And so I saved up for a year and uh, I'm publishing it myself. I published my first book and I'm gonna publish this, which I always say, I hope it's not my last. And it, it, is, uh, it, it's, uh, it opens with um, Jordan's poem, Blackmail, and then it comes to uh, a celebration of the March on, of the Million Man March, uh, Farrakhan's March. Then we have a, a poem on um, uh, Tupac Shakur on his last day. And then we have a poem on, it's called When My tr Phone Trembles, as a mother, uh, the last thing you want to hear is your phone ring at midnight because you know it's bad news. And then it closes with Jericho's poem, which Jericho had not uh, been awarded anything at that point, but uh, Jericho's poem is called Bullet Points. It's so wonderful because I wanted to show the men embracing my poems. And I thought, well, I'll publish it myself. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need you. <laughs> I'm not going to let you stop my words because somebody needs to let the black men know we love you and, and we, we expect love back. We expect it back. It's just that simple. It's not hard. We, we expect it back. I don't care how tired you are. When you come into the house, I want you to smile because I smile no matter how tired I am. So if we're lying, let's lie to each other. I think, yeah, when you look at the history of the black community of pretty much any community, the female, the woman is the backbone of that community. And oftentimes, I mean, even today, they're still the most respected group in society, black women, but women in general. And uh, that's definitely something that needs to be addressed um, by other black men. I think just embracing that and seeing the impact of your actions and the effect your words have, I think that's so important. Well, I think it is, but you know, I'm going back to now, I'm gonna go back for a minute to my grandfather. And then I'm gonna push back beyond grandpapa. And those men were great. I, I mentioned Mose Wright, and that'll bring tears to my eyes. It always does. Mose took his family to safety, to come back, putting his life on the line, which he did. He knew that the chances were, they killed him, the good chance they were gonna kill him, but he was gonna have his say. And if we go back to slavery, because it was slavery, you didn't beat your wife because she didn't belong to you. So why now, when she chooses to be with you, have you chosen this path? And I'm, I'm a big fan of black women because I think we're the best. I, I laugh, I write so many poems about black women. I think that whatever's gonna save the world is, is gonna be black women. But you know, black men, they're, they're good people too. And we just get used, we get in the habit of always having to hear about, you know, as I said, and you see the letter, you know, if, 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 if my gang, if, if Kwame and, 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 and uh, Joanne and I had robbed a bank, we'd be on the front page. If we had killed somebody, our pictures would be on the front page. So why can't we celebrate? You, you understand what I'm, so we, it, it's a black man. And everybody's, oh, well, maybe that's not important. But what's important, is that we let a black man know we care. And not all of those people are well known. Many, 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 you're a history major. You know Frederick Douglass, but you don't know the people. You know that when, when the slaves 
with the enslaved, I should say, were escaping. They escaped slavery, uh, slave plantation to slave plantation. And so I really hated it. I hated uh, Harriet. I hated the movie because nobody can run in the middle of the night. That, that's just not done. You have to move in the daytime. And that meant that you had to run and you had to run into the arms of the other people. So the other people on the plantation had to say who you were. So when the, when the slave master, not the slave master, because he wasn't going to come out there, when the, when the manager comes out there and he's got the whip and he says, I don't, you know, he look, I don't know that, who's that? And, you, and, you know, one of the black men said, sir, that's, that's, that's Brian, you know, Brian, he, he, he's, he's Miss Margaret's boy. He doesn't know you because he doesn't know one black person for the next. But that man put his life on the line right there to say a lie. You know him to keep you moving. And that night you could move on to another. Am I, you found, and these are not people we know. These are not people. We, 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 we don't sing their songs. We don't know who they are. We don't know their names. We don't know who gathered the first piece of wood and said, I'm gonna build a church out here in the forest, in the wild wood. I'm gonna build a church. And they began to do that. We don't know their names, but these were good men. And I decided I'm not going to, I'm just not going to spend my life trying to say something about the people who dislike me and my men. I have a son. I'm going to spend my time saying, these are the men that I, I, I care about. I know we don't have their names. We don't have the names of most of the people. If you've been to, if you come to the United States, there's a lynching museum. And they're, they're saying, well, we don't know a lot of, it. it's always unknown, unknown, unknown. Well, most of what is unknown are women because they lynched a lot of women. And we know that white women in Appalachia were lynched because they helped the enslaved. And so as, as you go on, if you decided, okay, I'm gonna go and get my doctorate. I'm gonna go to Oxford. I like Oxford, I taught at Oxford for a year. I'm gonna go down to Oxford and get my, my doctorate. And I'm gonna study, I'm gonna study this. You're gonna find out some other things about slavery, about the people we don't know. And it's not the people who ran and I, I I admire the people. I don't even know how to say it. I admire the people who ran. And I laughed with somebody recently. I said, you know, if I had lived during Frederick Douglass's time, it would be a pleasure to have gone to bed with Frederick Douglass. He was, he, he was, oh yeah, he's cute. And you know, you feel like you have to do your part, you know. But uh, it's the it's the it's the people we don't know. It's the people who stayed. These were brave and wonderful people. And they built families, they built churches. They built schools, they built homes. And, and, and you, you're asking me a question. These are the people we have to find a way to praise. We have to give a, a praise song to them. That reminds me of a famous Maya Angelou line where she wrote, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. And that's an example of that. Yeah. There's so many people, and obviously both of us being historians, we know this in history, only a handful of people are valorized and celebrated. And often we forget the mundane um, contributions of everyday people, helping them to climb on top of that ladder. So when you get to the top, you're standing on 10,000 below you who helped you up. So I, I, I believe that and I hear that, but I wanted to move on to talking about the black arts movement. And you are often considered a central force in this movement. Could you talk to me about why you think that movement had such a significant impact to the black community and the way they saw themselves and their position in society and the world? I, I, well, I think it was wonderful, but again, um, I, I've been looking uh, at the Windsors. I don't know if you have been following it. I don't know if they show it in, in, in uh, England. But uh, of course, you know, everybody's interested in, in, in Queen, as I said, I had the pleasure of meeting Queen Elizabeth or she had the pleasure of meeting me, however you want to look at that. But I've, I've been watching that. But you remember Margaret and them all wanted to come to America. Edward actually uh, gave up his throne to not, they say to marry um, Wallace Simpson, but I, I think there are a few more things going on there, but that'd be something for some other historian to look at. But I do know that, Edward wanted to be a part of the roaring, what they call the roaring twenties. 
And that was what black people did. We were the ones that started the Charleston. We were the ones that sang that song. And there's a wonderful British woman, and I did not have an opportunity to meet her, and I'm so sorry, named Mabel Mercer. And you talk about cafe society. Uh, she ended up coming to the United States, and she ended up, and I did meet him, uh, mentoring uh, a young man named Bobby Short. And they were always at the uh, Carlisle Hotel. So, you know, poets don't have any money. So it took me a while to be able to, like once a month, be able to go and hear her. I did get to hear Miss Mercer sing. And, and of course, I did get to hear uh, Mr. Short because I was doing a lot better. I could go. And I don't drink. Well, I do now, but I didn't drink then. And so going to a uh, cafe was cheap for me. And that, and that really worked. Black Arts Movement did the same thing. We just went on with what we had to share with each other. And we had the bookstores there. So you notice that they you notice that they have closed down almost all bookstores. There was an, an incredible bookstore called Michaud, Louis Michaud. And Louis Michaud's uh, brother was Reverend Michaud in Baltimore, had the biggest church in Baltimore. And he was married to a woman uh, named Betty Michaud, who was from Columbus. She was Betty Michaud when she married him, from Columbus, Ohio. And so we got to know all of them. There was the Liberty Bookstore. Now we're just talking uh, uh, New York. But all over America, there were uh, bookstores. And bookstores started popping up uh, in uh, uh, Detroit and then Chicago. We, we had places that we, uh, that we gathered. And people could come or not. But it's like everything else with Black Americans. By the time people started to see black people coming and saying, well, why are they, why are they coming? <laughs> what are they hearing? Then everybody else wanted to come and, uh, and it, you know, come to a book, uh, a book signing or a book party or come into a book uh, reading. I had a, uh, a book signing for my second book, which was called Black Judgment, J-U-D-G-E-M-E-N-T. And that was not a misspelling because I wanted to say we were judging. And one of my readers was uh, Morgan Freeman who was my next door neighbor. Yeah, it was really nice. And Morgan was just a, I haven't seen Morgan in a couple of years now, but Morgan was just a, a, a question on Jeopardy. And that was, a, he was a, not a question, he was a, a, a whole theory, you know, how they do those things on Jeopardy. He, he was on Jeopardy, like, what part did Morgan Freeman play? And I was laughing, I thought, oh, you know, I know I'm getting old because I'm looking at Jeopardy and now my neighbors, <laughs> people that I have known, are now questions on Jeopardy. So it's like, whoa. And I look at black stamps. And so many of the people on stamps, uh, Gwen Eiffel was just on an American stamp. And I thought, but I knew Gwen. I, you hate to see people you know <laughs> on stamps. I think that the black arts movement, we were open and welcoming. And we allowed people to do uh, what they wanted to be a part of. Uh, we were fortunate in that we got uh, uh, NPR to, uh, not NPR, in, uh, that other one, uh, to, to do Soul. And because Soul was so important, we were doing, uh, Don Cornelius did Soul Train, and then a couple of other uh, less serious uh, shows got on. Then pretty soon it was like, let's all dance. And I thought that that was a shame because uh, Soul had, of course, the singing, of course, because you can't have Black people without a uh, song. But we also had uh, the interviews. We also had people that, that we thought should, should, uh, sh that the community should be able to, to hear. And uh, I, th I think that uh, the Black Arts Movement, it and I, I went back. That was a long answer. People don't ask me questions for that reason. I went back to Cafe Society because the black community has simply continued its art. And in the old days, we could go back to, uh, you know, snapping your fingers. Well, you know, the, the, the white people took the drums away. And so when they did, we went to snapping the fingers. And we didn't have shoes, so we didn't have to worry about tapping. But in, in, uh, in 1865, when we were finally free, the first thing that almost everybody did was buy shoes because everybody was so thrilled. And we put taps, we took pieces of iron, and we put that on the shoe, on, on the bottom of the shoes, and we, and we tapped. But another reason we put it on the bottom of the shoes is that it kept the shoes working. So 
we did a couple of things. I, I lived, uh, when I lived in New York, uh, I lived down the street. Uh, well, I, I live in a great neighborhood. Gregory Hines was uh, down a, another block from where we were. And Greg Hines is one of the Hines brothers, you know, Hines Hines. They, they were great, but uh, Gregory danced. And looking at that, uh, that whole, what we did with what we had. And so everybody thought, oh, isn't that clever? But it wasn't all clever. Sometimes it was necessary. And we look at, uh, and I, I say it all the time, Brian, and it's true. I've made mistakes, I'm sure, in my life. But one of them that I always will consider my biggest mistake was the first time I went to G's Bend. And some of your listeners won't know G's Bend, but it's in, uh, it's in the river, G's River, right there in, in Alabama. The first time I went to G's Bend, they had those quilts. And I could have bought a G's Bend quilt for like $100, maybe less. And I just didn't, you know, I, I admired him. I thought, oh, isn't that great? And now those quilts, the, the women of G's Bend, the quilts of G's Bend, are hanging in the Smithsonian, selling mostly for $10,000, but mostly not for sale at all. And so we took and did, and you asked Black Arts, but we all did what we had. We, we took what we had, we put together what, we had, and and we 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 found some 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 joy and love in what we had, and I'm still I am still, uh, uh, and I'm just sorry I don't have a G's Ben quilt, but I I'm still very fond of uh, of quilts. Nothing makes you better, and I had uh, I and I, I still never I don't know the word for cancer. I still live because I'm still alive, so I don't know if I had it or I have it or what. But when a friend of mine Ethel Smith, Ethel Morgan Smith. Uh, Ethel told her mother, you know, Nikki has cancer, she has to have an operation. Her mother quilted, made a quilt for me. And I have it right here. I have it right here. And it's just something very comforting. You know, you, you want to sit and watch TV. I put that quilt. Her mother made me a quilt. And it's not going to sell for $10,000. But it was just the fact that her mother said, well, what can I do? What can I do? And that's Black Arts, too isn't it? Mm -hmm. And when they took away, when they took away the, 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 a lot from the boys who were singing, you know, we had Motown and there was, they were going to take all of that away. Well, then the boys started rapping, didn't they? And I love that. It was, oh, I don't know if I like that rap. Well, then don't listen to it. <laughs> that's, that's too easy. <laughs> you don't like it, don't listen. But the boys, when they took away the mics and they took away the clubs, and so black arts was over, but this next thing coming, but the whole world raps. Every place you go, you can hear rap. You can go to China, hear somebody rapping. I think it's just incredible the the power of the art of Black Americans. I think it's incredible. I really do. And you, you speak of rap, and I'm I'm interested to know what kind of rap music does Nikki Giovanni listen to. I gotta confess, I, I'm a Miles Davis, John Coltrane. <laughs> so if I'm not actually listening to spirituals, I'm probably listening to jazz. I listen to enough, you know, uh, uh, of course, Tupac was uh, a, a year older than, and uh, again, I haven't figured out verbs on that. I don't know if he was or is, but um, my son is a year older, a year younger than, uh, than Pat. And so his death was, uh, was very sad. And so I listened to that because Tupac was important. He, not that other people aren't. Um, the, the youngsters now, if I can use youngsters as a term, they're 30 years younger than I am. Uh, they're, they're into business. They're, they're doing an incredible job with, um, with business. They, they are acting. They are putting their own shows together. They're putting shows on the road. They're speaking for 10,000 people. So we're proud of all of, of, what, um, of what they are doing. But if you're saying, you know, am I just piled up in bed on a rainy day? You know, what am I, what am I listening to? It, it, it's, it, it's most likely going to be some jazz. <laughs> in, in preparation for this interview, there was a quote that I came across and it stuck out to me. It was a quote, you can't be ideologically driven if you're going to be a writer. And I was thinking about all your poetry that I had read and all the work that you do. And it seems like there's always a pro-Black message embedded within that. And I was wondering, could you explain what you meant by that quote? You can't be ideologically driven as a writer. 
Well, you can't. I mean, you can't make up your mind. This is what you think. You, you, have, to, you have to keep learning from yourself. And I do, uh, Brian, I do say that all the time that when, if, if any writer would write me, and many uh, do, and I try, people forget that everybody doesn't do email and stuff, and I would be one of the people that doesn't. So you have to send me a real address. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, that can be hard. I have learned to appreciate uh, the electronic, whatever this thing is that we're doing, video and stuff. Uh, it's good because there's so many people who can be homeless. And if they didn't have a way of communicating through email or messaging, uh, you probably couldn't talk to them. So I'm not being snobbish. I just have never really um, learned it. And um, I guess at my age, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably not. But I know you can't go into anything with your mind made up. This, that was a long answer to You can't make up your mind. And you can't let other people. I'm, I'm having a fight right now. I'm not a fight. A uh, discussion with um, an editor. And uh, they're saying, you know, well, we'd like to know something about your childhood. And I said, yeah, I don't mind. You know, it, it, it's all a story. You know, <laughs> I can handle that. Well, we were thinking it should be. And I said, well, now, who's, <laughs> whose life are we talking about? If it's mine, this is the way it goes. And if you want something else, I think you should call somebody else. And then they mentioned, well, there's this, they mentioned the name. I won't mention the name. And we really like what she does. I said, well, then call her. Don't. Don't let me hold you up. Call her. I'm sure that she'll be glad to write another book for you. And I won't. I'm only going to write what I can do in front of me. So when I say you can't go in, you can't go in with your mind made up that this is what I ought to do. And you certainly can't, or at least I guess that is arrogance. I'm arrogant enough to think I'm not going to let somebody else tell me what I think and how I should think. I'm going to write what I want to write. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Standing in the need of prayer. I did. We've saved, I say we because I'm working with Emily Cobbles. We saved enough money. I, I did because uh, she actually is, is hired by me. Have saved enough money to publish it myself. I'm not going to let, be, I, I'm not going to be pushed around like that. I don't even know how to tell you. I am not going to be pushed around like that. So if right now, when we hang up, if I fall over and drop dead, I have left enough of everything so that that book is going to get published because I'm tired of people picking on black men. I'm just tired of it. I have a son. He's a great guy. We've had our differences because all. If, if you have a son and you haven't had differences, y'all haven't talked. <laughs> well, you do it. it. It's the nature of, of, of you know, I have, I have, uh, I, I live in the country here and I have uh, uh, robins. I have other birds who the, the, the uh, sparrows come out too, but I have robins and the robins, you know, come and they, they make their nest and stuff and it's nice. And then the bird, the babies are born. And then all the babies do is, is you know, I want food, I want food. I want, and when you can hear all that, I want, and that's what they do. And the mother goes out and some poor little caterpillar or something gets caught and she feeds them. And then the next thing you know is they're saying, well, I gotta go now. And, and I'm sure she's saying, what the hell is this? I've been feeding you all. I've been taking care of you. And now you're just going to leave. But that's the nature of mothers and children, probably fathers too. But fathers are even, they're definitely in, in, in season. I, I would say that they're there. I think that somebody ought to study. Why is it that human male, and I don't mean of any color, race, or greed, but why is it that human male does not have a season? Human male has sex all the time. And you can see it's ruining everything. They ought to have a season. So they ought to, you know, like, ooh, okay, it's going to be time pretty soon. And then everybody would be happy. <laughs> and we wouldn't be having these wars and things. <laughs> but, no, I think what you said about not letting other people tell you your story, I don't think it's arrogant at all. I think it's authentic and knowing your boundaries of what you're going to do, what you're going to allow. Um, but I'm interested to know, what is your writing process whenever you're writing poetry or books or anything? How do you get in the zone of being the great Nikki Giovanni? <laughs> no, that's very kind too. Uh, I, I do a lot of thinking and um, I've gotten to the point now because I'm old that I, I, I go to bed. I have a, 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 a pad that's by my bed now because I'll think of something in the middle of the night. You know, he'd be one of the, oh, that's a great line. And then I'll write it in the morning, but then I wake up in the morning and know, I know that I had a great line, but I don't remember what it was. So now I have a pad and 
in the middle of the night, I, I, I jot it down. I, I try to think of what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, really get done, standing in the need of prayer, which obviously I'm, I'm incredibly fond of, came uh, because, because actually of uh, 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 Trayvon and the uh, cover of that, uh, Trayvon Martin, and the, the cover is a hooded boy with uh, a, a hand is coming out and the hand coming out is a blue, it has a blue cuff and it has a gun. And I think that that's one of the reasons that people don't, my publisher didn't want to publish it. Oh, it looks like, you know, he's getting shot in the back. I said, no, it doesn't look like he's getting shot in the back. He is getting shot in the back. He and a lot of others, it doesn't look like it. That's what's going on. Well, we don't know. You know, that'll, that probably will hurt somebody's feelings. But well, then they won't buy the book. Yeah, you know, I, I'm just too old to care, and I, I did my job. I, I my, my parents, uh, I, I, I went back home. My father had a stroke. I went back home, and I, I took care of my parents. I took care of my son, and I've done what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to starve to death. It's not, it's not likely. And if I do, the hell with that. But if you're going to shoot people in the back, you ought to have to see it. And we were talking about the New York Times. If, if, if you're going to be mean. And, and not let people like us celebrate Jericho Brown, who is wonderful. The, the tradition is just a wonderful book. But even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, why wouldn't the New York Times give us a page to say we celebrate? Why, why wouldn't they do that? So, oh, that's not the way we do business. Well, it's the way I do business. So they're mad at me, so I'm mad back. These things happen. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm indifferent. I, I keep watching some youngsters out there, and I, I worry about them. Well, I want to write a bestseller. Well, what the hell? That's not what you want to write. You want to write a great book. And most of the people who wrote great books never saw them published even. Think about, think about, I mean, even Bill Shakespeare, for God's sake. We're still reading Shakespeare. He never saw all of his things happen. And, and you can't think like that. All you can think about is this is the truth that I want to tell. I mean, that's the way I look at it. And uh, I, I don't, I still don't, I don't like being told what to do. And um, I doubt that I'll get over it at my age. I just don't like that kind of, this is what you ought to do. No, that's what you ought to do. I ought to do what I want to do. So I'm, I'm in favor of everybody. I'm in favor, you know, the, the gay community, I'm in favor of the gay community because it's none of who, whose business is. And I was laughing about sleeping with Frederick Douglass, but of course you would. Who wouldn't sleep with Frederick Douglass? <laughs> I for God's sake. But, you know, there are sometimes, but I can tell you this, for $130,000, I wouldn't sleep with Donald Trump. And that's what he had to pay the last time he paid somebody to sleep with him. I know, we know that because we know that that's a part of it. And so we, we have these kind of things going on that, that you say, well, I'm just going to try to live my life and I'm just going to do the best that I can. And uh, if it doesn't work for you, and I understand, you go on and do yours. I'm not trying to stop you. I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to let you stop me. Or I talk to uh, some high school kids and I don't talk to high schoolers much because a lot of reasons, one of their, they're dumb, but <laughs> they are. But I, I said to them, you know, there are a lot of things in, in, in life and, and you're saying, well, how do I become a leader? How do I change the world? And I'm going to answer that. And I did. And I do. You are not necessarily going to, you're not, you are not going to change the world. Your job is to make sure the world doesn't change you. That's what you, you, you don't want the world to make you be something that you're embarrassed about. You, you just, you don't want that to happen to you, you know? And I say that to the white people I, 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 I talk to, and the, the kids that I talk to. You don't want to wake up in the morning and, and, and see Donald Trump's face in the mirror. You, you would like to see yours. You, you would like to see, this is who I am and this is what I do. This, this has to be something more to your life than trying to be like something evil and crazy. That the only thing that matters, money is important. And, and I'm, I'm not, I'm an American. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it's not, but there's a limit and there has to be enough. And that's something that everybody has to learn. I think that, that that's in Solomon. I don't read the Bible that, that well, but I think that's in Solomon. There has to be enough. I don't think he says it that way. But there has to be. You can't let things control you. Nothing. Not money, not food, not sex. Nothing. 
And you're, you're speaking of some of the challenges you have when obviously talking to publishers, talking to editors. As a writer, is this something that you have to deal with a lot, conflating your creative process and also the money-making mission of the publication? No, I don't have to worry about the money-making because, <laughs> because I'm just the writer. <laughs> My business partners have to worry about the money maker. My, my publishers have to worry about it. What they have to know though, is that I have written something that's truthful. And I would hope that they know that's meaningful. And I would hope that they, and uh, that's one of the fights that we're, it's not a fight, it's a discussion that we're having, is that they have a, enough courage to know that we have to do some things that we're not sure where it's going. You know, I would, uh, I haven't been uh, banned yet, but uh, <laughs> I would be delighted that, that they banned some of my books, you know, or one of my books because, oh, we're going to ban it because we don't think people should, you know, they banned uh, 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 The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison's book, got banned because they're, oh, I don't think people should have to read that. Well, if you don't think they should have to read it, you know, don't read it, but you, you can't ban it. Because you, oh, well, I don't think people should know. You, what, what shouldn't they know about? What shouldn't your 12-year-old girl know about? That you're having sex with her? You think she doesn't know that? You, you think she's missing something? That you're beating her mother? You think she doesn't know that? Of course you should read The Blue Aside. Of course, it, it, what's the point of banning something? What's the point of saying, we don't want them to have that? Get over it. And I don't know how else to say that, you know, uh, this is uh, in the United States today that we're talking, this is what is called Memorial Day. And Trump, of course, whom I dislike, as you probably have gathered, was screaming at everybody, I want everybody to go to church. Well, on Sunday, he was on the golf course. Is that church? Is, is that what, and, and, and to see that people actually listen to that crap, you know, you can't go, if you can't find God in your heart, in your home, without spreading a germ, then what's wrong with you? And yeah, I don't even know where to begin with Trump. So I'm not, I'm not even going to try. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I, I need, it, it just it makes me so angry to keep hearing this and then to, to, to read a letter in the editor. They were mad at me because I, I, I wanted the class of 2020 uh, I think that they should have a monument. I think the class of 2020 has, has, has done its job. We all have wars that we fought. This is, this is Earth, this is not even America. We have all fought wars. And I live in the state of Virginia where the big war was, of course, what they call the Confederate War, you know, war between the states, civil war, whatever they want to call it. But the South lost as well they should have lost. But they have monuments, they have statues that they're now taken down. Why would you have a statue of Robert E. Lee? He not only lost, but he was a traitor. And he would be one of the many. Why is it that we can't, that we can't have a statue up for these kids that says class of 2020? And we're here at Virginia Tech. As you can see, we have uh, a lot of nice space. It's really, it's really pretty space. Why can't we do that and, and, and engrave their names, have their names put in so that they can come and show their grandchildren? Why couldn't we do that? And somebody said, you know, well, Nikki Giovanni's crazy. They didn't really do anything. I went to war. Well, I'm glad you did. But that's, that's not the war that they have to fight. The one they have to fight, the one that you have to fight is I went to college. I tried. I did what I was supposed to do. And now the one thing that I was looking forward to is walking across the stage getting that, that photograph taken, smiling, and I can't do it. it, it it's been taken away from me. It, it, it's only a question of what's been taken away. In some cases, it was taken away because of World War I or II or Korea, and others is taken away because of a disease. But you mean we can't say to you, we appreciate the fact that you were, you, you showed some courage, you showed some, some, some politeness, you mean we can't, we, we don't have enough what? Marble or stone? But what, what is it that, that, that we don't have that we can't say to you, we're proud of you? 
you get sick of that. You, you, I mean, I'm, I'm just an old lady, but you, you get sick of that. You kids have worked hard and you deserve us knowing, yes, you worked hard and we're proud of you. Yes, we are. Well, on behalf of the class of 2020, thank you for that. I mean, um, is, we're all having to adjust to, to this and the virus has brought new challenges for everyone to try and just register, first of all. But you've taught in numerous universities and we were just talking about the subject of banning books. And I wanted to know, what is your stance on no platforming? So this issue of not allowing some controversial speakers to talk at universities, what's, what's your take on that? Well, the point of, of, I know any liberal arts university is we have to hear everything. So that's gonna mean we have to hear people that are stupid. So in other words, if, uh, no, you do, and you hate them. If, uh, what's his full name? Mike Pence came to Virginia Tech, right? I would pick it. I would, I would uh, agree. I would be with the kids. I would pick it. Pence is a fool or Pence is, you know, whatever evil thing I could say. And I would walk around with the kids. Now, does he have a right to speak to the people that want to hear his stuff? I'm not going to stop that, but I am going to have my voice also. Now that means here in Virginia, that there's a chance as did happen in Charlottesville, that some white supremacist for whatever that could mean, if the only way you can show you're supreme is to kill people, would run down in his car and, and run over some of us. Because yeah, those are the things that happen to go out and get their gun. Oh, <laughs> Brian, I have to tell you this, because you might not have been aware of it. We're having, in Virginia, we're having um, a fight politically about whether or not uh, the gun control, whether or not we can have guns and whether who can have them, whatever. And so everybody, the, the governor, all of it, and everybody's got good sense, says, you know, it's time for, it's time for these guns. So, you know, you have to stop these, these guns. You don't need them. And guns are, are you know, rifles are, are used for, for hunting, but AR-17 is just used to kill people. You know, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and so they went to one of the local stations one of the gun shops opened up because it was essential, if you can believe that. One of the gun shops opened up and so they started to talk to people and they were saying, you know, why are you buying a rifle? Why are you buying uh, uh, an AR-17? Why are you buying, you know? And one guy said, well, there's a virus coming. I got to protect my family. I, I <laughs> oh yeah, shoot that virus. <laughs> you show that virus. <laughs> what the, I can't believe the no, it. Can you imagine anybody that incredibly stupid? What are you going to do? It, it, when, the, when the little spittle comes out of somebody's mouth, you're going to sh <laughs> Are you crazy? And there's like, no, I got to protect my family. It's, oh my God, I feel so sorry for his wife. But I don't have a problem with, um, with, with people speaking. And there are a lot of people that I don't want to hear. And I'm sure that there are people that, uh, that don't want to hear somebody like me. And, and you know, it, it goes, that's the, the way it goes. And so I don't, uh, I just don't have that, that, I don't think it's a good idea to ban. Okay, I just, I just don't think it's a good idea. Now, I would protest, not them speaking, not them speaking, but what they're speaking about. And I think I have a right to do that. I think I have a right to either pick it if I wanted to, or uh, depends on if I had time, have a t-shirt made you know, Trump is a fool or something. And then I can sit in the audience. They can't take me away from that. I have a voice too, and I have a right to have a voice. But I don't think I have a right to keep other people. I have a right not to, not to clap, you know. But then I, you know, I don't stand for, for that thing, uh, Star Spangled Banner. I can't think of anything dumber. You know, I, why should I stand for it? And I was telling my son the other day, you know, I said, you know, they, they, they miss, miss uh, 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 translated the words, you know, because when you get to the end, you know, oh, say, can you see? It got mistranslated because it ends up, it should end up, it's a uh, land of the, uh, the free. And I, it, it should have been, oh, the land of free white men and the home of brave blacks. And Thomas said, do you, I said, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it, it comes from Latin, so you need to look it up. <laughs> We need to, well, that's what, about what it is. It, it's free whites and, and brave blacks. And that's what makes up 
That's what makes up America, you know. But uh, it, it, you're asking me, would I ban them? It's still, no, I, I, I just, that doesn't work because it works both ways and it's not a good idea. And I know in America, um, I think it's in the um, constitutional legal training, they always say you have to protect the opinion you hate the most. That's the opinion you have to protect for a democracy. So, well, no, right. as uh, as 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 uh, Pito Corleone says, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Closer, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love the Godfather. You just learn so much. <laughs> now, I wanted to move on to talk about two incredible women who you were friends with and who you've described previously as being great influences uh, for you, Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou. Could you talk to me about the way that they have influenced or impacted your life and your writing career? I think uh, that we have shared a friendship. And I say we, I mean the three of us. And I always tease my Maya, because Maya and I, you know, you talk about food, which is where we started this conversation. But Maya, you know, always, well, she's done a couple of cookbooks, actually. And she's always, well, I cook this. And I'm always saying, Maya, you know, I, I'm a better cook. I said, you know, I, I think you're a good writer and I, I, I love you, but I think I'm a better cook. And we went back and forth and back and forth on that for a while. And uh, I only live two, she's gone now, but I only live two hours away. I live up here in Virginia. She's in, in Wake Forest. And one day she called, and she said, well, you know, I have a couple of people down there, one of whom actually ended up being Oprah. She said, you think you're such a good cook. Why don't you come down? I said, oh, got you. And what I took, because what I make, I, I make great chicken, but what I wanted to do was my best. It was a, a rack of lamb. So I took a couple of rack of lambs. And uh, Maya's kitchen um, is, is a chef's kitchen. It's, it's an incredible incredible kid, you know, and I, I, I cooked the, the, lack, the rack of lamb and, you know, we did the dinner and it was just so funny. And so we're sitting there and Maya is sitting at the head of her, she always sat at the head of her table and I'm looking at her and I'm just waiting to see what she's going to say. And so she's eating, she says, well, it could use a little salt. I said, girl, you ought to quit it <laughs> because she knows damn well I cook better than she did. And uh, Tony and I, we were just, and again, it's not, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm with them at a point that it's not going to be an influence. It's going to be a friendship. And so uh, in, 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 in terms of, of uh, Tony, of course, uh, I think I was closer to Tony than uh, Nehemiah in another kind of way. And when my mother died, uh, it was Tony that I called and uh, that I talked to. And uh, I just wrote a piece about that recently. I was invited to write and, and I did because I was, uh, you, you're sad when your mother dies. And uh, I was just talking to Tony, was, you know, and she listened and listened, listened. And she finally said, I got I got to go now. Yeah, if you knew Tony, I got to go now. I said, okay, I'm sorry, because I take up a lot of her time. And she said, uh, you, I, I have to say this, Nikki, right. She said, that's what you have to do. She said, right, I'm going to go now. <laughs> and uh, that's what I've been doing since mommy died. I did it before, but... Uh, it was a different uh, friendship. Maya and I had a, a good, Maya was always kind to my mother, by the way. And uh, Maya knew mommy longer than, and better than, than Tony. So I always appreciated uh, Maya. And I would go down to see Maya just because she's only two hours away. And sometimes she would be lonely or, I don't think, well, I shouldn't say lonely, but because she had a lot of people that come and go. But I, I don't want a lot. So I'm an easy person speaking of those two women, to get along with because I'm not asking for anything. And uh, I enjoyed it because I always enjoyed teasing Maya. Her, um, her cook, by the way, uh, was great. I spent the night down there one night. Uh, I spent a couple of nights, but one night she was on the first floor. And what I call my room is in the corner there on the, on the second floor. And uh, I was up reading. You know, Maya had to go to bed. She was, she was not well. And as you know, ultimately we, we lost her. And I was reading and I said, oh gosh, I want another piece of that chicken because it was good. And I was up and I said, I'm gonna go down. But I remembered something that a lot of people who didn't know, <laughs> but Maya always kept a gun because uh, of a variety of reasons. She had a lot of death threats and stuff. And I said, I wonder if it's safe 
to go downstairs because the relationship of the kitchen to her bedroom. And I said, if she hears me, I'm a dead poet. <laughs> and so <laughs> I went down and I opened the, the kitchen and I picked up a couple of pieces of chicken because I didn't want to come back. And I got upstairs and I went, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because I thought if Maya heard me open it, her you know, door there, I'm, I'm gone, she would shoot me. Because so she's a Mississippian, you know, you have to remember that. And um, she, that is she, one. She, that is one risky snack. <laughs> it was, it really was. But it, it was really funny. It, it's something I laughed about because I told her, I said, I came downstairs and got chicken. She said, I know. And I believe that she did. I believe she heard where I was coming. You know, I believe that. I said, I know. I said, oh, won't do that again. <laughs> She's a great old gal. And it was, it was fun. Um, I didn't lean on, on Maya the way I lent. Uh, Tony, I, I, it was kind of my bench in a way. She's someone I leaned on in, in a very different way, but uh, my, it's just a lot of fun. It's always good to be with her. I watched the amazing celebration evening you had for Toni Morrison, and I loved watching that. I mean, I'm a great believer in praising people while they're there to actually receive the praise. And what she said during that speech about how she was left speechless by all of it, I, I thought that was a wonderful thing to do for your friend. Yeah, thank you. I, when she said, and, I, and I'll, I'll never forget that either. She said, well, if nothing else ever happens in my public life, this does it for me. And um, it, I had to go, of course, to my mother and father's funeral. And my sister died uh, about three or four weeks right after my mother did, so I had to do that. But I, I couldn't, when Tony died, I couldn't go. And my friend Ed Witch uh, called just to see if I was all right. Because uh, some people know I was close. She said, well, you know, we were we were looking for you. And I said, at which all I can honestly say is I did the life. And so I was, I, I'm just going to let other people do, do the death. I did the life. And I do, I think that I did, um, I think I did what I was supposed to do. I did the life. Now, I wanted to end our interview with a few quick fire questions just to get your lasting thoughts. And I was wondering if you could uh, finish the sentences. I guess. The greatest misconception about me is? That I'm friendly. <laughs> I'm not friendly. I am most proud of? Always being me. My biggest regret is? Not buying that, <laughs> that quilt in the jeans bin. <laughs> Can I, I be rich now? If I had bought a couple of quilts. <laughs> oh, well, those quilts, I can only imagine um, what they look like. I'll, I'll go and search it afterwards. Oh, yeah. You, you can look them up. G's been, G-E-E. -E. You'll look up. Oh, they're beautiful. And they're beautiful. finally, I want to be remembered for. Doing my best. I've, I've always done my best. And I've had my best life, and I, I, I hope to have my best death. Nikki Giovanni, thank you so much for joining us on Telefriend.